take a moment to introduce our guest for today and after that we'll have a holistic discussion with the rich experience of ma'am and surely feel free to ask relevant questions and each of one should restrict their questions uh, i mean in a limited time and that should not be like asking specific about which mutual fund to buy or sell that those questions will not be entertained so guys uh, today we have with us uh, monica halan ma'am uh, she is a trusted uh, personal finance writer speaker author and uh, she has uh, got over 30 plus years of uh, uh, rich experience uh, her career span across media public policy and financial education she is the and uh, uh, founder of dhan chakra financial education and author of the best selling book let's talk money and that has been translated into hindi marathi and punjabi and we also have uh, a new book from her uh, which is getting very popular uh, best seller i must say let's talk mutual funds uh, around which we have discussion today and she is the chair person of sebi's advisory committee for investor protection and education fund a member of hybrid securities advisory committee she has public policy experience and had served on several high profile government of india committees that have changed the regulation around consumer protection in india she has also worked uh, across uh, media organization in india to name a few the mint the economic times the indian express and she was editor with outlook money successful tv series around personal finance in nd tv z and bloomberg india by education she is an ma in economics from delhi school of economics and uh, actually a double ma so the other ma is in journalism studies from university of wales and ma'am is based out in delhi so a very warm welcome ma'am and just in case i missed anything on your introduction i would request to suffice that and yeah over to you ma'am no 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 i think this is more than enough thank you so much delighted to be here thank you so much ma'am so i mean we we always start with a very basic question ma'am so how it all started for you i mean your uh, career of 30 years so initially like how you landed up in the financial markets so any any thoughts on that ma'am no so basically i think first jobs happen almost by accident and my entry into the media was because i was certain i did not want to go into academia which seemed like uh, something too abstract for me so my first job was as a trainee researcher in business today that time the magazine was just starting out so i started my career as a business journalist but very soon made the tr- transition to markets and then um around 19 uh, 96 97 97 made the transition into personal finance which was then a new genre in journalism so personal finance as a genre did not exist till the magazine intelligent investor came out and that uh, was transformed later into something called outlook money so i was part of the startup team um, uh, and really had the first thoughts in india about uh, looking at individuals as the people whose problems we need to solve rather than think of business magazines whose focus is a lot on the corporate on the ceos so that's how the journey really began as a journalist but as i got deeper into personal finance i realized what a huge gap there is between what people know what they understand and what the financial sector actually puts out and does because financial products are invisible it's very difficult for a average person to understand what is being told to them and obviously the person describing describes only the good parts they don't describe the bad parts of the product they don't describe costs they don't describe um the true return so i felt that as a journalist in this space it was my duty to learn more so i actually did courses i joined one of the first pe- batches of uh, certified financial planner i did the course passed the exams understood did some uh, deep learning on basic finance as well because my specialization was economics and finance is a little different so i basically went into a deep learning mode to uh, you know b- before i can write i should know what i'm writing and i my thought really was that i should be 
So the thought was I should be 10 questions deep, right? In the sense that if you know something, then you can go on answering a question for at least 10 questions deep. So that was the thought that you go very deep into an area where there wasn't that much focus because I felt that it was needed. And India, remember, was just opening up. 91 was the big economic reform. And these products were just coming to market. So it, it happened that my career also sort of took off with this uh, financialization of the Indian economy. And I have kept pace in terms of trying to be useful to people who want to interact, who want to enter the markets, who want to understand finance, but are not able to. So this really has been my journey till now, Prince. Great, Pam. So, Monica, ma'am, like when we start, we all struggle, and you must agree. Like you also had uh, something of that sort. Like uh, initially, we are clueless where to start. So, what would be your suggestion right. on that front? Like uh, when people of the likes of say they graduate and just enter their new jobs and started saving small money, how should be the starting point for them? Yeah, and that's very important. It's an important question that you ask because, you see, we spend so much of our uh, childhood and early adulthood in learning, in going to specialized courses, IITs, IIMs, or just simply graduation, post-graduation, some skill development courses. And the idea is that this is all towards earning money, isn't it? That you want to earn more money. Therefore, you become, you, you get educated, you learn more things. But the entire education system doesn't tell us what to do with the first salary check when it comes or the first bank credit when it comes. Nobody tells us. So, I mean, this is one of the problems. This is one of the puzzles I set out to solve when I wrote Let's Talk Money. I also thought that there are a lot of good books on finance for individuals out there, but they all start at a certain level where they assume that the readers know the basics. And I realized as I did a lot of talks, so I do a lot of corporate talks, I do talks for even regulators, <clears throat> my understanding was that not many people understand the basics, you know, the basics of your own money management. So you can have a bond trader who sitting in Singapore is doing millions of dollars worth of trades. But as she told me that, you know, I had no idea what to do about my money. I made the same rookie mistakes. So this is, you shouldn't feel as if it's only you that doesn't understand. Nobody understands it. Which is why uh, Let's Talk Money is sort of a, you know, it's the first book that you read as you start finishing college so that you already have a roadmap. And again, one of the first things you do is to set up a cash flow system. You know, investing in that book comes in chapter 10. It's far, far away. You first learn to swim in the shallow before you go to the deep. So that's the attempt is to build such a strong foundation that you understand what to do with your money and you have an investor mindset and you don't have a trader mindset. Those are two very different things and both are important in markets. Traders are extremely important. Speculators are important. But if, you're, uh, if you are an investor, then you shouldn't make the mistake of thinking you're a trader. So those are some of the first steps that uh, essentially you've got to also know yourself. What do you want to do? Do you want to be trading that has a set of consequences or do you want to be an investor or do you want to be both? I mean, that's also uh, a viable alternative. Right, ma'am. And I, I think like that is the best book on personal finance I came across so far. Uh, kudos for that. And secondly, like ma'am, what, what we see is like normally people have follow the herd uh, mentality and uh, whatever investment they make uh, that has influence from their parents or maybe the family yeah. So, so on that front, like, uh, I mean, <laughs> how they should channelize their energy in understanding the importance of personal finance? No. So the thing is that you get your family also to read. Uh, let's talk money at least. Talk about the lessons because the older generation, you must understand and be kind to them. When they were in their prime earning years, these options were not there in the market. It was uh, LIC, UTI, SBI market. That's all that there was. So for that generation, all this is new stuff and they needlessly are a little suspicious of it. So it's a good idea to start engaging with them to make them understand how as markets change, as the underlying changes, you need to change the way you deal with your money. So I understand that they're very risk averse, but 
you know, that's your opportunity to talk to them about the different faces of risk. There's also risk of inflation. If you are a FD only investor, then there is a problem of uh, having too much allocation to the fixed deposit. So I think a conversation about money within households is extremely important. And to get them on board willingly is far better than to do things that they distrust. That, that would be my suggestion. Right, ma'am. So those who know you and have read your book are already about the concept you told about, like maintaining different accounts. So would be grateful like if you explain that again to our audience, ma'am. No, so look, one is that this is only the starting point, so you have no option but to actually read the book. But very simply, look, these are insights which are coming out of a branch of economics called behavioral economics, which says that we are not utility maximizing rational human beings, economic agents, we are humans. And humans make irrational decisions and choices. And there's a concept called mental accounting, which means that we form mental accounts about different things and we get stuck to the purpose of that account. Okay, so for example, you could have run a credit card debt that costs you 24%, but you could also have 3 lakh in a fixed deposit giving you 5%. It doesn't occur to you to redeem that, to break that FT and at least pay this high interest loan immediately because if you do the math it doesn't make sense to earn five percent when you're paying 24 percent so but because we have made that a mental account that this is credit card and this is towards my investments you don't make that those decisions so that very simple insight has been used to separate savings and spending so most people when they start earning their first thought is we don't know where the money goes we are uh, uh, we know when the money comes, but usually the money gets over before we know it. So my system is a, it's a triple S cash flow system. The triple S is separate saving and spending. So it's a triple S cash flow system where what you do is your first bank account is a salary account. All the money in your life drops into that account. And then at the top of every month, you move to a second bank account and you call it my spend it account. Okay, you're giving labels to it. The first is income account. Second is a spend it account. And the third account, you call it invest it account because you want to start investing out of that. And the labels are chosen carefully so that your brain remembers that the purpose is investment. So when your salary comes in, you're moving some amount of money to spending, spend it. And you're moving what is left to the third account, which is invest it. And initially, we're not investing anything. We're just getting into the habit of separating this. For six months, you can experiment to see how much really does the month cost. And if there's not a single rupee being left over for invested account, you know that there is a problem. At the beginning of your career, you should be able to spare at least a couple of thousand rupees to put into your invested account. I can understand that it's very tight in the beginning, but some small amount you should be able to transfer into your uh, invested account. So that's really the first steps that you take, that you create this cash flow system. Now, at a glance every month, you know how much you're spending, what your total income is, and what your saving potential is. And this saving then becomes investment, which you know, is what we deal with in the rest of the book, is how do you convert savings to investment? Because remember, Indians are very good at saving but uh, converting this saving to investment is where we all falter because there are too many choices out there. So this system, this triple S cash flow system allows you much greater control over your financial life. And remember that, you know, your savings can be a residue or it can be a target. Whether you put the money in the invested account at the beginning of the month or at the end of the month. You know, those are decisions I leave to you. Everyone's an adult. You can take your prudent decisions. So do you spend what is left over or do you save what is left over? These are your personal decisions. So uh, my, my system leaves a lot of choice because I feel that as responsible adults, we need to take, we, we understand the consequences of our actions. And unless we own the action, we will never get committed to it. So whether your savings is a residue or a target is entirely up to you. But the system allows you to make that decision. 
So that's really the first starting point of uh, Let's Talk Money. Ma'am, like asset allocation is indeed a very important aspect. So how to build a sense around it in the sense like when we, uh, as you rightly explained, uh, we started saving. Uh, so normally, uh, most of the people have a small ticket size initially and uh, investing in various assets is not feasible at that point in time. So on that front, how you would suggest one should go about it? So the first thing that you build, everybody is build an emergency fund and that has to be either in a fixed deposit or liquid or money market funds. If you understand debt funds, then you invest in them. Otherwise, just remember, there's no shame in being in a fixed deposit. I know a lot of people try and say that only uh, losers invest in fixed deposit. That is not true. It is prudent to put your long-term investing into uh, equity but should you not understand those markets, it is better that at least you are safe with the product that you know. But for your shorter term, and especially for the emergency fund, you must have a fail-safe product. So a fixed deposit in a large commercial bank, whether it's private sector or public sector, no cooperative banks, no corporate deposits, but a large commercial bank is the place where you build your first investment, which is an emergency fund. Asset allocation will come much later. That's what I'm saying. You go step by step. Don't rush into investing. You come to investing after you have done the basics of your cash flow, your uh, emergency fund, your insurances. Then you figure out, uh, you know, how long can you leave the money in the product for? Is it a short term, medium, medium term, long term? And depending on when you want the money back, the product choice will open up after that decision. So we, my only suggestion is don't rush into this. You have a lifetime ahead of you of uh, investing. Get your foundational concepts right. Get your foundation very strong. And then once you've built your system, you just have to run it for the rest of your life. So this asset allocation conversation in my book will come far, far, far later. We are still preparing to invest, um, and that has a lot of preparatory steps till we get to that point. And a lot of your money will go into doing some of these things like building an emergency fund, buying the proper insurances. You will be, by the time you get enough surpluses to start thinking of asset allocation, you are going to be in your early 30s. It is going to take you that much time to build your base, a solid base there. So, ma'am, being the chairman of uh, SEBI's advisory committee, which has focus on investor protection and education fund, so do you think, like, uh, I mean, uh, over a period of 30 years, things have evolved and there are so much uh, changes on the regulation front? So, do you think the gap between uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the spread of financial uh, knowledge is uh, the gap is uh, diminishing over a period of time and also like uh, for investor education what steps you think are necessary uh, be it from SEBI or maybe uh, some educational institute should uh, also uh, include uh, these as a part of that month yeah, so I think SEBI has done a fantastic job in trying to make markets safe for retail investors. And what it has done is it has categorized retail investors as the absolute uh, new entrants into the market who use the mutual fund and especially the passive fund route to start investing. And then you will have the PMS, the alternate investment funds, and also then there are the direct stock investors, the traders. So rules for the mutual fund industry are the strictest in the world in India because SEBI has taken the view that this is the investor who needs a lot of protection in the product construction. So they have hard-coded consumer protection into the uh, structure of the mutual fund. They've done that by taking away the loads. They've stopped upfronting of trail. Uh, a lot of reform has happened under the bonnet which doesn't even come into the, into the view of a retail investor. But I've been part of the mutual fund committee till 2021, you know, for a period of 11 years. And I know the kind of hard work which goes to make the product safe. And when I say safe, it doesn't mean it guarantees return. It just means that it is 
safer from manipulation than before it is safer from uh, costs which are hidden costs that are too high so it's trying to give a fair product to the market it's trying to make disclosures so that people understand what the product is and see the true face of this invisible product and then it is up to the investors to either work with a financial planner distributor or educate themselves if they want to go direct so that decision again is left to the investor that should you want to go direct you will have to learn how to drive this car you know a sports car in the hands of a person who can't drive is fatal but a sports car in the hands of a accomplished driver is fantastic so your uh, sports car is ready the investor has to decide whether it wants to hire a driver in the form of a planner or a distributor should she want to drive herself then she needs to learn read the manual learn how to drive this vehicle and then get on the road so i think the industry has done a fantastic job in terms of investor education both uh, the intermediaries and the product manufacturers i think they've done a good job my only uh, what i would like to see is to see personal finance financial education get embedded into the school and the college curriculums because we learn a lot of things but we don't learn what to do with our money and somewhere the purpose of education seems to be in india to accomplish you so that you earn money but nobody tells you what to do with it so you know it will be far easier to deal with the second level of investor education if we got some basic uh, education done in both schools and colleges so that's what i would look for in the future great ma'am so i mean uh, since the topic for today's talk is let's talk mutual fund so uh, i mean maybe i'm wrong but in my opinion mutual fund is uh, one instrument which is least understood and people don't have right set of expectations so i mean any any uh, i mean let's talk a little bit about the mem basics and what all uh, the uh, retail investors who start uh, to invest in mutual funds should look for and the house is always uh, divided between uh, direct investing or uh, investing through a distributor so any any thoughts around that also yeah 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 absolutely no you, these are good good places to begin a uh, mutual fund is a way to connect household savings to three kinds of markets stocks bonds and real products like gold and real estate okay so it's a it's a it's a route it's a road there are three pipes which are connecting uh the household savings and converting it into investment through the share market through the bond market and through gold real estate is still very nascent so we will just keep the conversation to gold and then combinations of these asset classes so a lot of first time mutual fund investors make the error when they think that a mutual fund is an equity product it is that but it is also a bond product it is also a gold product it is also a foreign fund product it is also a combination of all of these so the first thing to understand is that there are 37 categories of mutual funds sebi what it has done is that it has divided equity into 11 categories debt into 16 hybrid into 6 and then more okay the uh, other categories there are two other categories two other classifications now 11 categories of equity you don't need all of them you need maybe two or three categories 16 categories of debt you don't need all you maybe need two or three so an entry level investor has to really understand that you don't start by choosing mutual fund schemes you don't you don't look for tips to say oh this small cap fund has done 150% return in the last 3 years so i'll buy that that's just the wrong way of doing a stable investing uh, it's it's a it's not a stable investing approach because you will constantly buy yesterday's winners a more stable approach is to first choose the categories and again i describe this in great detail in my book let's talk mutual funds which again the aim is to help you design your own system so that you can choose your funds you don't have to ask anybody else that uh, which are the five funds that i need to buy all right it allows you ownership on the process so that you can also update your portfolio when you need to and as far as your uh, direct versus regular 
Look, direct plan is for those who know what they are doing. They can build their portfolios. They know what asset allocation is. They are able to update their portfolios twice a year. And they are able to use their portfolio to fulfill their future financial needs, both short, medium and long term. The portfolio should allow them to withdraw, to redeem without disrupting the entire portfolio construction for goals as they come up. Now, if that sounds too complicated, you surely need a distributor. Some of the distributors have excellent planning services as well. Or you need a financial planner who the planner will take a fee and put you into a direct plan. The distributor is compensated by the mutual fund through trail. So I'm saying don't uh, uh, grudge them that trail. A lot of the distributors do a whole lot of work. And it's also very unfair to go to a distributor, tell them your uh, issues, get five fund names, and then go and buy it direct yourself. You're harming yourself because in six months, maybe something changes in your life. Maybe in some six months, something changes in the funds that you have bought. You will need to update it. So especially when it's an active portfolio, you need to look at your portfolio at least twice a year. Look at it twice a year. Maybe once in a year, you may need to move out some fund because either a goal has been achieved or the fund has fallen off the performance. Maybe your goal set has changed. So I, my only suggestion is that regular is not bad. If you are getting the service that the trail commission uh, that you're paying, that the fund is paying the commission for, it's totally worth it. Some people absolutely don't grudge. In fact, they tell the distributor, why don't you charge me more? I'm getting so much value out of you. So you see what kind of value you are getting. Um, you should be ready to write a check to the financial uh, registered financial uh, advisors, the RIAs, and then they will put you into a direct plan. Should you want to do it yourself, you have to do the work. Every year at tax filing, you will have to struggle to get your own paperwork in place to give the capital gains certificates. You know, so there is a whole lot of ongoing work that, a, that maintaining a portfolio requires. If you want to do it yourself, definitely direct. If you are unable to do it, you will have two choices, either regular or pay the fees and go into a direct plan. This space was downloaded via spacesdown.com. Visit to download your spaces today. So there has to be some cost, either in terms of your own time or money. Right, ma'am. And few takeaways would be like uh, the, uh, the mutual funds take better care of the asset allocation. And the people who think if you buy mutual fund and you should forget uh, are oblivion of the fact that it should be reviewed uh, timely. Active and funds, definitely. See, passive is different. If you're buying the Sensex or Nifty 50, it's a fill it, shut it, forget it. You you don't really need to do anything. But if you're doing active funds, you definitely need to review your portfolio. <clears throat> and also I've seen, ma'am, like people are averse uh, to paying the small upfront fees to the financial planners and rather they will directly give uh, losses in the market uh, and later uh, they, they get, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, obviously, they, <laughs> very few people sustain for a long period in time in the markets after losing money. So, I mean, uh, role of financial planner is very important. But the penetration, do you think it is improving over a period of time? No, I think the distributor penetration is fairly okay. It can be much more. And as the market develops, I think we'll get far more people coming in. The registered investment advisors is still very, very tiny. It's a more of a boutique service. My, my sense is we'll need a large pan-India, deep-pocketed company to come in and set up a, a you know, nationwide financial planning service. This is entirely possible. Uh, then we will get to a scale. Otherwise, the registered investment advisors will always remain boutique. You will need large, you will need the solution of capitalism. We'll need capital to solve this problem of uh, mass financial planning service, which serves far more people than it does today. Right now, we've got few speakers. We'll take them uh, one by one. I would once again request to keep it short and uh, don't ask any mutual fund name uh, bias. Yeah, uh, I, I don't recommend products. Right. I only want you to choose your own. 
right ma'am so sanjeev uh, you have been waiting since long you can unmute and ask your question to ma'am okay thank you uh, yeah monica ma'am uh, hmm. yeah my question is about uh, how do you find the right balance between the paying the loans and investing uh, so just give me a little bit uh, background on that so i have been investing from the last 3 years uh, current my age is 28 and i have been invested total like 10 lakh in the mutual funds only uh, not being the direct stock investment and just mm-hmm. now i'd like uh, bought uh, a house loan of around like 75 lakh so what i'm looking for how do i find the right balance uh, should i uh, underweight the mutual fund uh, investment and more pay the loan uh, so that i clear that in next 7 10 years uh, or um, should i go hand in hand it's fine if you pay the loan for like 12 15 years but making sure that okay you are investing as well so my uh, currently the question is only about like balancing the both the things uh, so do you have any advice on that uh, yes and no it's a great question i think it's a very very important question and you've touched upon an issue which a lot of people grapple with that uh, there is a loan and there is also the desire to invest because everyone says that the longer your money stays in the market the better it does so what you need to remember is that you have to look at your potential rate of return on your investments and compare it with the post tax interest that you are paying because you have a home loan you are getting a tax break as well isn't it so you yes, yes, compare yes. the two so look if if you are on even in a passive fund we are thinking of a 12% cagr that's what we've seen in the last 30 years that's what most of the experts are predicting for the next 15 20 years that it's a 12% cagr so what you will have to do is you'll have to sit with the excel sheet and do your math i don't know at what rate and we we cannot solve this live here but you will have to sit with your excel sheet and see what is your effective rate of interest on the home loan and this argument you can extend to other loans as well you have what is a productive loan it's a good loan because it's buying an asset suppose you had said that you have a credit card loan which is costing you 24% my answer would have been completely reverse it would have said that pay off this high cost loan because my return is i'm projecting at 12 but i'm paying 24 so this every rupee has to go towards paying off this high cost loan so uh, what i'm doing is i'm giving you first principle advice so that other people can also use it which is to say that look at the financial numbers if it makes sense if you are if your return on your investment is larger than the payout that you're making and it's a good loan it's a productive loan you keep the loan going you keep your investments going every time you get a bonus or you get a bump up in your increment try and prepay the loan because finally we want to be loan free as soon as possible so so you know sometimes you, you somebody repays you money some uh, so parallelly you try and prepay the loan with every extra bit of money that you get but you keep your investments going because the time in the market will be very powerful especially if you are investing through the equity route sanjeev okay yeah that helps thank you thank you sanjeev all right and next is uh, rishab rishab you can unmute and ask your question sure hi monica ma'am thank you yeah hi rishab i have yeah. read the book almost twice or thrice so far wonderful i hope you have implemented it padhna to theek hai usko implement karo i have some ah. concerns with respect to the same tell uh, me so my concerns are primarily related to i would say asset allocation like mm. how the asset allocation is i am now now 28 and about to be married in 6 to 8 months period congratulations and i like see like i see a lot of i would say responsibilities getting in financial responsibilities in that hmm. period of time and i i would say in my portfolio i have 60% or 50 to 60% as a, a, equities but i have okay and 40% is debt although gradually like i would say being a indian middle class mindset when we say that i do want to invest into debt on a monthly or a quarterly basis but uh, i just have concern like as your book says that your Like equity or your the debt ratio in your investment portfolio should be the age you are. So, but mm. that necessarily doesn't really fit. I would say why because I I'm, 
I mean, I won't need advice on that same like uh, once one become a family person. Like, how does was you will have your expenses, and as I think Sanjeev pointed out uh, on the question of home loans and all. So, I mean, investments keep getting on on the market period. So maybe I would say some instance on the maintaining that distribution. I would say equity and debt. Is it like a strict or I would say no, 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 no. <laughs> See, the book also says it's a rule of thumb. See, that's why it's personal finance. Each story is different. Okay, which is why uh, in a book, only very generic directions can be given. We can only tell. We can point you in a direction, but we can never give specific advice. And this specific advice usually is between a planner and the client. Um. your exact allocation will really depend on uh, you know things like for example is your spouse going to be earning as well uh, how many dependents you think you might have and i'm just giving you i, mean, I don't need answers right now mm-hmm. these yeah, are the things you yes, think yes. about um also is there provident fund being cut from your office because should that be the case then already 24% of your income basic is going towards a debt product Hmm. because hmm. provident fund is already debt yes and if you've also got a ppf you know you add that to it so your debt allocation is already happening then you hmm. add another debt component through your emergency fund because that's also going to be in debt yes and then you have to see that you think will there be need for money in within 3 years hmm. within 5 years how much of your excess money now can you park for the long term okay so you know you could have a need for a down payment of a house or a car those will be far short term you cannot use equity for that then you work backwards to see what is the surplus i have that i don't need in the next 7 years i know that i don't need it that is the money you park for equity so your asset allocation can be very different ideally it is equity 100 minus your age Yes. which means 70% but when you have considerations of shorter term goals so again further in the book i also say that that goals nearer to today need 100% allocation in debt and goals far away from today need 100% allocation in equity so when you do both of these you will come to some amount of 60 40 70 30 somewhere around that range you will come and please count your provident fund and your ppf towards your debt allocation a lot of us forget to do that and we consider only the debt funds or the fts as debt allocation and that makes us uh, underweight in equity uh, yes you are right okay yeah okay i think i think yeah, that Thanks. was the main concern with respect to asset allocation but yeah otherwise i Super. think uh, other the book has been pretty much helpful i just have to say that again that's great that's good and to hear and congratulations for your forthcoming wedding rishab sure yeah thank you thank you very much thank you uh, rishab and uh, next we go to wish wish you can unmute and ask a question uh hello ma'am this is vishalia i just have a i'm fine kind of primarily invest in index funds but there is kind of like a war on twitter right between index and uh, like uh, like the active funds so what would be your approach ma'am because i primarily invest in index but i'm interested in active too what should be the ideal approach that right. i would ask your your approach is right your uh, so my approach is uh, it's it's not a all or nothing approach so this binary is on twitter and everywhere it's an all or nothing that you're either in this camp or that right. camp i'm saying you have to do both it has to be an indian thali approach which is everything on it what does that mean that look at your equity allocation as a portfolio itself okay so there is debt and equity now you are look only looking at equity as a pie as a pizza pie half of that pie is your passive okay because we even within equity there is low risk medium risk and high risk half of that can be a large cap if you find a large cap which outperforms the market otherwise a passive on a nifty or sensex is fine and then a quarter quarter pie is a mid cap and a small cap and these active funds have done exceedingly well so again if you follow the process of let's talk mutual funds you will be able to shortlist consistently performing schemes which you can then add to your portfolio 
right so it's an active plus passive approach which gives you the stability of half your portfolio in a passive fund and a quarter each in a small and a mid cap active fund so i'm saying do both wish yeah but one question i had so do i need a mutual fund distributor for the active funds uh, because i'm just if you can decide on your own if you if you have the ability yeah, right. to the time, do the work with ha uh, right see it's a question time. of time or money like yeah. i said it's a question of so if you don't have the time then you will need the services right. and again choose the way that you choose a lawyer or a doctor right. choose your financial distributor or advisor just like got that got it got it because you need additional pair of eyes you never know you know <laughs> absolutely and again you know for the kind of work they do don't grudge them the money that they make because they do work some of them they are very very good practices that i have come across obviously i cannot recommend anybody but you ask for recommendations in your network and there will be one or two names which will always filter through which are common ideally speak to at least three of them see it's a very close bond between the client and a planner they know your family inside out they know your fears and your uh, problems inside out so see with whom you can form a connection who understands what you're doing and i think go with that person this, this is literally it's a lifelong relationship with a distributor or a planner Thank you. One last question I had: Can we replace the index fund with a flexi cap fund? You reckon? I mean, just or should I? Oh, uh, I am not a big fan of flexi cap, and I'll tell you why. Because see, there are two very similar. There's a flexi cap and a multi cap. A flexi cap leaves the allocation changes to the manager, and from what I have seen, they are all large cap oriented. So they. uh they are supposed to guess the surge in the mid and the small caps but they don't from the data that i have seen they don't most of them don't whereas a multi cap sebi says 25% of the aum must be in large minimum in mid and small so by default you get actually a fund which is across the three categories so i find if you're choosing between flexi cap and uh, uh multi cap multi cap seems to be more fair to the label of the product but in your large cap why would you want mid and small cap so if you if you're slightly riskier on the large cap then you do a large and mid cap you know so that uh, you reduce the passive to say 30 35% and add a slice of pizza pie to having a large and mid cap because that gives you a slightly higher mid cap orientation but the large cap orientation is still very strong so i wouldn't want to replace my uh passive index with a either a flexi or a multi cap because then that's my entire portfolio then isn't it thank you ma'am thank you for your time all right thank you wish so monica ma'am overlap within i mean while constructing a mutual fund portfolio uh, looking for the overlap among the uh, options you are choosing is very important so uh, can can we drive the session around that so that uh, audience can get a clarity on that uh, no what did you say the clarity on what the overlap between the categories right yeah 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 so look there are 11 and there are 16 debt and i was part of the subcommittee when these categories were made and i can tell you that uh what we wanted what i wanted from the investor point of view was fewer categories what the industry wanted was unlimited categories so what you see is a compromise between uh what some of us wanted in investor interest to have fewer categories which don't confuse investors and the industry wanting far more than what finally has happened there are some categories which were already existing large and mid cap for example which had thousands of crores of aum so there is going to be an overlap you out of the 11 you select the categories most of the categories you don't need Uh, you need you can look at a large large mid cap mid cap small cap most of the other categories i'm not sure why they are there because 
you know, finally, what is a value fund? Value is also what everyone else is trying to do. Uh, so I am not very certain uh, what is the benefit of most of the other categories. You find a category that you think has great relevance as a slice of the portfolio. You can add that to it. Again, don't do an all or nothing approach. Build the portfolio. Have the core in a lower risk equity. And then you build slices of the pie with increasing levels of risk. All right. So you, you try that approach rather than this year I will do only small cap. And this year I will do mid cap. You will never win because you're, you're investing in last year's winners. So portfolio approach is extremely important for a stable uh, ride through this market. And also, like, uh, I'm not sure how far uh, this is true. The AUM, AUM size is like directly proportional to the performance. Is that? Uh, no, 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 no. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think there is. Uh, I don't think there is relation. If you have very large funds who do equally well, so I don't think it's just that if it's a very very tiny AUM, then possibly the fund has not been in existence for too long, and I like to see a 10-year performance before I put my money in the fund. So a 10-year-old fund with small AUM is itself a red flag, isn't it? That it hasn't been able to garner enough investors. So use that, you know, use your common sense to gauge that uh, the fund has been in existence for all these years, but the AUM is tiny. What could be going wrong? And there are fund houses who have been there for 20 years, but when you look at the AUMs of their schemes, it's it's smaller than what an average distributor might be managing. So those are red flags that you look at. Right. So we'll go to next speaker, Amar Deep. You can unmute and quickly ask your question, please. Hello. Uh, yes. Hi, ma'am. Yeah, Amar Deep. Hi. Hi, uh, ma'am. Just uh, I want to ask uh, one question, ma'am. If we uh, see for longer term investment, like retirement goals and what, so can we uh, 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 increase our allocation to small and mid caps heavily? Uh, Amar Deep entirely depends on your ability to take the risk. Right okay. now, you're looking at super normal returns on these categories. Mm -hmm. We have had periods where these numbers were minus, minus 30%, minus 40% return. Okay, okay, so these, they are very volatile. Mm -hmm. My only suggestion is that you take the decision of increasing allocation knowing that there can be a deep uh, erosion of value for years before they do well again. So when you look at 10-year, you know, take a look at 10, 15-year returns. Okay. Those are the realistic returns that you should think you will get. But there can be periods in the middle when you see capital losses. Yeah. Are you able to take that? Will you get out of the fund and then say this category is bad? Mm -hmm. So if you have the power to stay on, have conviction in the fund, you have a good fund and you have conviction. And in fact, you go on buying more through your SIP as that price goes down. Then okay. seven to 10 years later, you have a great return number. But if okay. you're buying now, looking at the super normal returns over the past few years, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's something called reversion to mean. We don't know. Does this fall after this? We don't, nobody can predict it. All I'm saying is uh, the March and April of 2020 were very good. That was a very good time to fix your equity asset allocation when the market had tanked to what? 29,000 it had gone. Uh, stock markets had vertically crashed during COVID. Before, we, nobody knew they would go up like a kite, but they had vertically crashed. It is at that moment that you fix your equity allocation. Okay. When there is blood on the street, are you still able to go out and buy? Okay. If you are, then... You know, then you decide your don't ever decide your equity allocation in the middle of a bull run. Decide it when markets are crashing because that's your true risk level. I know people who went out and sold their entire equity portfolio. 
sensible people senior people in that uh, uh, dip of 2020 they just sold their entire portfolios they just didn't have the conviction so equity is having a great fund and then just having the conviction of staying on for see i say that these are uh, forever funds you actually never get out of them you just milk them when you need the money but as you keep growing in your careers you'll keep earning more you'll keep adding to the fund and you know you can keep milking the fund and uh, keep investing as you need so this thing of i will book my profit and do what so if there's a goal you fulfill that goal but when you book your profit what is you going to do with that money you'll have to find somewhere else to invest why not let the fund carry on look at the 15 20 year return numbers no so before you increase your allocation remember that these are volatile categories they can fall as dramatically as they have risen they can fall equally dramatically but then go to either value research morning star look at the 10 15 year returns and then make your decisions okay um morning i am like uh, you you i mean uh... during the conversation you touched upon the very important aspect of behavior right because yeah. most of the participant uh, do not have uh, a right set of expectations and especially when uh, we talk about mutual funds so obviously it take few years before one can realize uh, that they compound and they can build wealth over a period of time so i mean how had been your experience initially and what would be your suggestion how we can condition our behavior so as to understand that things will take time for sure um so see my own conviction comes from the fact that i've done the maths behind this there's something called rolling return where is you look at uh you know the be- the best year over a 30 year period and the worst year of holding so if you hold for any one year in the last 30 years it would have got you 160% return there was one year in these last 30 years where you doubled your money in a year more than that but there was also one year when you lost 60% but if you increase the holding period to 2 years on 3 years your in over 3 years you got 60% return cagr but you lost 20% there was one two year period when you keep doing this math there comes at seven years where we can say that there is no seven year period in which the sensex or the nifty 50 lost money okay so the maximum and the minimum begin to converge and the what is the average the average is about 12 to 14% depending on when you do the maths when you do the calculation so my own conviction comes from the fact that i've done the data um we are in a growth economy there is a certain amount of math which goes into prediction which is gdp plus inflation plus something called equity premium so if you look at forecast for gdp take 6 and a half take 6% inflation we are already at 12 and a half plus equity premium whatever that number is fixed at so for me there is a math to this uh going forward so if the indian and honestly my biggest fear right now what is the biggest headwind for indian growth which we we, we seem to be certain on a 20 year growth path is a fractured electoral mandate in 24 we need somebody to come with full majority whoever that is we need political stability so that the economic reforms which we've seen in the past few years are carried on full steam we've seen a huge number of reforms happening the ibc the uh, the whole digitization the uh, upi the benami transaction code the bankruptcy code we've seen very deep reform happening and the fruits of that are just beginning so i think uh, for me when i do the calculations ahead some of the headwinds are really to do uh, are political otherwise we are on a strong path so investors also need to understand that stock markets is not a gambling den it's not a place where you do satta that is for a trader but for an investor there is a certain logic which goes into predicting where the markets will be so you need to know that you need to manage your expectations 3 years mein paisa double nahi hoga if you're lucky you if if you do that you've been lucky it isn't that the markets have 
will always double your money in three years. If you if it's happened to you, you've been extremely lucky. But what can we reasonably expect as an average rate of return? That those expectations you must manage. Right, ma'am. And also, I would uh, like to draw your attention because these days uh, we are seeing so many fund houses are getting uh, mutual fund licen uh, licenses. So, uh, do you see uh, that will have some consequences in the space, or our market is so big so as to like uh, absorb those? Uh, uh, I mean, you know, by twenty forty seven, India will have very few people left in the extreme poverty basket, if any. we will have uh the it will be a middle income country you think of the market in the next 20 years where you have moved from extreme poverty to a low mid to a middle middle com com income country my sense is it's only just begun and every new entrant does the innovation no old older mutual fund house is known for innovating the innovations all come from the new they are hungry for aum they will get new products new flavors into the market so i think it's very good news for investors as new players come in and they try and uh, grab market share from the existing players they will have to work harder so i think it's good all right ma'am so sumo you can unmute and ask a question and before that Prince, can we Can yeah, we just yeah. do one last question? Yes, I was about yeah. to ask on team, ma'am. This is the last question. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, ma'am. What is your view on uh, yeah, gold? Hi. What is your view on gold as an asset class? You know, you're uh, not very audible. I can't hear you. Can you just repeat? Uh, is it okay now, ma'am? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, what is your ma? Uh, what is your view on gold as an asset class, ma'am? And also for a thirty-five year old, uh, what should be the ideal? allocation to gold uh, apart from equity and uh, debt so the Thank average you. return on gold over the last 30 years has been about uh, 9% okay 9% cagr has been the return on gold gold has very dramatic cycles up and down so if you can time that then you know your returns are very very good but i don't think many people can time these markets gold in itself doesn't give off a uh, dividend interest rent it only gives you profit the only product which gives you interest is the sovereign bond so gold as an asset allocator is great for that uh, you know little bit of uh pie in your overall allocation to give that little bit of stability of that 9% return it's almost little debt plus okay it's a little bit of a debt plus return it don't look at gold for super normal returns that only equity will give you most indian families have an allocation to gold through jewelry which is not really gold because you end up never selling jewelry and it is also required for weddings and all that so between 5 to 10% if you have of your portfolio in gold it doesn't harm you but don't look at gold for super normal returns there will be times in the in the cycle when it will do very well but the cagr is about 9 that's my view on gold thank you, uh, you ma'am ma'am uh, ma ma uh, one more question uh, suppose uh, i want to have uh, gold as part of my allocation uh, portfolio portfolio allocation so what should be the so, your, your voice is breaking and uh, really sorry uh, we are short on time uh, maybe in no, next okay. time thank we you, can uh, so monica ma'am thank you so much uh, for doing this today it was really helpful and surely look forward to many more sessions uh, uh, down the line as when time would be available any concluding remarks from your side ma'am no thank you for inviting me i hope everyone does prudent investing all i can say again and again is get your basics right get your fundamentals right know who you are as an investor before you step into the markets uh think of a lifelong relationship with your mutual funds don't think of a short term i will profit from it uh, attitude because you are going to be investing lifelong so what you need is a, a system 
a strategy which is a lifelong strategy and you need products which are lifetime products so think of it in your life cycle approach rather than a short term i will double my money in 3 years approach that's my only last set of suggestions to all you people thank you so much all for joining this co co uh, conversation i really enjoyed it thank you thank you prince thanks again ma'am uh, it was really nice uh, listening from you directly and both the books are really well and i strongly recommend to our audience uh, they will surely cherish uh, the experience which has been poured into both the books and uh, very helpful for everyone and i i would also recommend people that they, they should give uh, these kind of books as a gift to their friends and family so that the penetration of personal finance uh, should be widespread with this uh, i i thank everyone uh, for sparing time and listening to such wonderful thoughts from ma'am and surely will come again with uh, many more renowned uh, names in the financial market thank you so much guys and those thank who you. joined thanks. late thanks ma'am and those who joined late the session uh, is recorded and i'll be uploading it uh, over my youtube channel and the channel name is accidental investor prince i would request you to surely have a look and definitely you will find so many good videos about the financial market be it equity mutual funds personal finance uh, technicals what not so you will find uh, uh, videos uh, to all the things related to financial market and that is really beneficial uh, those are long videos you will need some sort of patience for that but again if you thoroughly listen to that directly from the practitioners definitely it is going to help you big time in the markets so with this note i uh, take everybody's leave uh, good night take care and keep coming to our spaces thank you so much this space was downloaded via spacesdown.com visit to download your spaces today 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 download your spaces today